Hello and welcome to Sunday School lesson number 23. Today we'll start a two-part series called The Fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn. Holy Spirit, we implore you to please teach us, open our eyes of understanding, and let our hearts be receptive, O Lord, to your word in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray, O Lord, at the end of this lesson, O Lord, we will understand what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is and how to exhibit all the traits, all the characteristics of this fruit of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Our lesson is taken from the book of Galatians 5. We'll be reading verses 23, 23 to 20, 22 to 23, beg your pardon. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And it says, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So you see a total of nine attributes uh, described there as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our memory verse is taken from Ephesians 5 verse 9. Ephesians 5 verse 9 in the King James Version says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. In the New Living Translation, it says, For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true, and that light is the light of the Holy Spirit. I've also included the Amplified Version here, which expands it a little bit. It said, for the fruit, that is the effect, the result of the light, consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So we can see, we can begin to build a picture of what the effect of having the fruit of the Holy Spirit is in us. There's light in us, there's goodness, there's righteousness, there's truth. By way of introduction, the Lord Jesus Christ, before he left uh, his earthly ministry, gave us the Holy Spirit for several reasons. One of the reasons is that he wants the Holy Spirit to help us learn to be more godly. The Holy Spirit will help us learn to be more godly. In John 16, 12 to 15, John 16, 12 to 15 says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, or whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to teach us, he will remind us of truth and help us to live in a way that glorifies Jesus Christ. Another reason why the Holy Spirit was given to us is to convict us of sin. Because the Holy Spirit resides in us, when we do wrong, the Spirit reminds us there's a discomfort, there's a disquiet within us. John 16 verse 8 says, And when he has come, that is the Holy Spirit, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So that's another, that's like an inner guide that tells us or reminds us when we are wrong. There are other reasons why the Holy Spirit was given to us. The third one we're going to talk about today is that the Holy Spirit encourages us to choose rightly when facing temptations or making godly decisions. There, that guide inside of us, the Holy Spirit is telling us which way to go. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that you will hear a voice behind you telling you this is the way walking. You know, that is telling you where to go. So the one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit was given for, to us is to encourage us to choose rightly. Ephesians 3.16 says, he, that he will grant you according to the riches of, the glory, of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So inside of us, there's that strength to take a stand. There's that strength to make the right decision, even if it's not popular. Even if it's not, you know, easy, 
He gives us that inner strength. The Holy Spirit gives us that inner strength and courage to take the right decision. In John 16, verse 13, it says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, but he will not speak of his own authority. For whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will tell you what the future looks like, and he will tell you where to go. Now, these characteristics that we've talked about, helping us to live a godly life, convicting us of sin, encouraging us to take the right decisions, those are, those are the characteristics that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. So let's go into the lesson itself. We have two outlines. The first one says, why fruit? You will notice that it uses fruit as singular, not fruit. And then the second outline says, the opposite of bearing fruit. If someone is not bearing fruit, what is the opposite? So outline one, why fruit and not fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is the result we should see in our lives after we have received the Holy Spirit as it continues working in our hearts over time. So it's the result. When someone has the fruit of the Holy Spirit, there will be evidence, there will be um, markers in that person's life that shows that that person has received the Holy Spirit. And he continues to work in our lives on a daily basis. And over time, we are transformed more and more into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Romans 8 verse 9 says, For you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if we are his, if we, are, if we belong to Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And we begin to see the fruit, the result of that indwelling. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Guess what helps us renew our mind? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit renews our Remember we said he walks in our lives. He continues working in our hearts over time. So our, heart, our minds are renewed and we begin to think godly thoughts and you know, take godly actions. So the, the fruit of the Spirit is the result that we see in our lives when we have received the Holy Spirit into our lives and we allow him room to operate. We don't keep silencing him or grieving him or shutting him out. Also, you know, we've read in our Bible passage that the fruit has you know, about uh, nine components. The fruit consists of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Love there is agape love, unconditional love. It does not depend on who that person is or what he or she has not done. You're not reciprocating. You're actually loving because, just because. Because that's how God loved us. He loved us even while we were sinners. Joy is that thing that comes from within you. You're just grateful. You're happy. It's not um, joy because you got bought a house or you got a new car or something. It's just joy of the Holy Ghost. Peace. You, you, you want to be at peace with people. The peace of God keeps your mind, guards your mind. So you're not easily troubled. Long suffering, you, you know, you're patient, you're persevere, you, you persevere, you don't um, you don't react so quickly, you're not irritable. You're kind, kindness, you're good, you do basically what is good. You have faith and you demonstrate faithfulness to others. You're gentle, you're not harsh, you're not brash, and of course you have self-control. You rule over your spirit and rule over your body and over your mind. Galatians 5 and 23, we read it earlier, that what the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And really, if you go all over the world, even secular laws, will not you will not be penalized for exhibiting any of these traits of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You will notice that the Bible uses a lot of agricultural metaphors because they are easily, easily understood. The, the, the law, a, a majority part of the world has you know, majority agricultural based workers. So the agricultural culture of that time and even now, these things are easy to understand. Even anybody knows what a tree is. Anybody knows what branches and fruits are. So the fruit metaphor helps us to see our faith as a tree with branches. That's that tree. And then it has branches exhibiting these very characteristics that uh, we're talking about. Now, if those branches do not produce fruit, there's something wrong. So for the tree 
and the branches of the tree to produce fruit, we've got to take care of that tree. If we take care of the tree, then the branches will give off the kind of fruits that we desire. Now, if we nourish the tree, that tree is God's word. If we nourish it, it will grow bigger. If we nourish the tree, the, the, the tree will grow, grow bigger. That is, the fruits that we're expecting, the characteristics that we're expecting will be more and more evident in our lives. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So the word of God is what nourishes the fruit and helps the fruit to grow bigger and more prominent. First Peter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So we want that tree that yields the fruits to grow in us, we've got to nourish it, and the food it needs, the nourishment it needs, is the word of God. Another fact that we need to know is that we need to clear away the weeds and, and pests and everything that, you know, that's to keep the, heel, uh, the tree healthy. If you plant something, you're going to weed around it, you're going to ensure that there are no pests, there are no pests, there are no insects or things that are disturbing it. Now, these weeds and pests represent our sinful tendencies. So we've got to clear them away so that the tree can be healthy. Ephesians 4, 22 to 31, Ephesians 4, 22 to 31 says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, or rather let him labor, working with his own hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that he may impart grace to the hearers. I do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Colossians 3, 8 to 10 says something similar. Colossians 3, 8 to 10. Say, but now you yourselves are to put off all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of who created him. So the weeds and the pests we're talking about are lying, anger, stealing, you know, malice, blasphemy, you know, all kinds of evil things. So we are to put them away, filthy language. We are to put them away. If we put those weeds away, those pests, those sinful tendencies away, then the tree will be healthy and the branches from the tree will bring out good fruit that we desire, the desired fruit of the Holy Spirit. Another thing we need to know is that if we consult and hand over to the professional gardener, that professional gardener is God. On our own, we may think that we are weeding, but we will not be as effective in weeding. We are not going to recognize some things as weeds. We are not going to recognize certain things as sinful. But if we allow the professional gardener, if we allow God himself to help us weed our garden and weed away those habits, some known, some unknown, some hidden, some very subtle. If we allow the professional gardener to work on us, then we will be on track and our tree that brings up this you know, great fruit of the Spirit will remain healthy. First Chronicles 16 verse 11. First Chronicles 16 verse 11 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. In other words, hand over your garden to God. Let God be the one to do the weeding and the, you, know, you nourish it with your word, nourish the tree with your with the word of God and let God himself begin to point out those things. It's when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict us of sin. He will lead us into all truth. So let God, the Holy Spirit, help you to you know, point out those things. Really convict us of sin. Some things we do unknowingly, we don't even realize they are wrong. We call, we say, we see we're joking, we call someone by a bad name, or we, you know, we do things that are not stealing or lying or committing adultery. Those are sins, but there are other more subtle sins. The Holy Spirit will point these out to us. If we are able to, if we hand over to God, seek his face, then we will be fruitful. Our tree will remain healthy and strong, and the fruit will be evident and, 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 and abundant. So before we end this uh, outline, this first lesson outline, there's a question for you and I. 
As a Christian, are you exhibiting all or only some of the constituents of the fruit of the Spirit? Remember, we named five, uh, nine attributes. Are you exhibiting all nine or just a few? If you're not exhibiting any, or if you're just exhibiting a few, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to ensure that you exhibit the full gamma, the full range of the fruit of the Spirit? That is food for thought. That's, you know, we back in our quiet time, we should ask God to help us so that we may bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in its fullness and exhibit all those nine characteristics that we have talked about. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. We'll now go on to the second outline, which talks about the opposite of bearing fruit. I think we have an idea what that means. If something is not bearing fruit, it's probably dead or not something. So here we are. So a Christian who is not exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit can expect one of the following results. There are actually two results that we'll talk about here. The first one, the best case scenario, is that that tree or that Christian is stagnant and not growing. So, you know, the, the, the best case scenario that we can say is that the, the Christian is stagnant. Nobody wants to be stagnant. Nobody wants to not grow. James 2, 14 to 26, James 2, 14 to 26 says, what does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you, do you want to know, oh foolish man, what that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what does that mean? You say you have the Holy Spirit, but we cannot see the evidence. It means you're, 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 you're just stagnant. You're not useful. You're not producing any fruit. You're just like, oh, I have faith, but you're not doing anything to help people. You're not demonstrating it. They, nobody can see evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're stagnant. You're not growing. So that is the best case scenario. So let's look at the worst case scenario. This is not good. Even the best case scenario is not good. But let's look at the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is death. A Christian who is not exhibiting the fruits of the Holy Spirit is as good as dead and is actually heading towards death. Romans 6, 20 to 23. Romans 6, 20 to 23 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A Christian who is not exhibiting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, who has been stagnant for so long, is ultimately going to end up dead because he is not useful. It says the wages of sin is dead. It means you are not allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit to rule. You are not loving, you are not patient, you are not kind, you are not gentle. You are probably demonstrating something else that is not fruit of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of its way is death. So let's be on, the, on, on guard. If you say you're a Christian and you have received the Holy Spirit, there must be evidence through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If there's no fruit, there's a problem. You've either stopped growing, that is you're stagnant, or you are dying. If we not die, in Jesus' name. You're dying spiritually, physically and spiritually. May we not die in Jesus' name. Now, 
the, the passage we read, Galatians 5.22, starts with a but. It says, but, um, can just, if I can just bring up some of the earlier passages uh, and see that it starts with a but. It says, but. Just bring that up. Say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. So it starts with a but, meaning it's, you know, it's, um, the, the passage preceding it has a, has, has a message. Something was said before, then it says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So what was, what was said before we got to Galatians 5.22? Let's read it. Galatians 5.19-21. to 21. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, it means you've been operating under Galatians 5, 19 to 21, exhibiting these traits, these works of the flesh. I said those who practice them will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they are going to die spiritually. Okay, so anyone who doesn't have the effect or the influence of the Holy Spirit in their lives will be will exhibit these negative traits. I pray that none of us will fall into that category described in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. So what have we said in summary? First, the fruit is not fruit, it's one. It's the result of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We exhibit these traits because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, okay? We, the faith of a believer is like a tree, and that tree has branches, and these branches are the traits that compose, that constitute the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If we care for the tree very well, it will produce fruit. If we neglect the tree, it has grave consequences, including stagnation and death, okay? Our sinful nature tends to produce rotten and poisoned fruit. So we have to war, we have to put them to death, as we read in Colossians. We have to put them to, we have to subdue those things. We don't have, we should not give room for flesh and you know, our nature to operate. But with our spiritual nature, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, he produces beautiful, nourishing fruit that reflects God's nature and benefits us and those around us. When you exhibit love and joy and peace and self-control and gentleness, you know, everybody wants to be around you. It benefits you. It benefits the world around you. I pray that from now on, we will all exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus and that we will not fall back and start exhibiting the works of the flesh, which can ultimately lead to spiritual death. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We pray, Lord, Lord that your Holy Spirit that is indwelling in us will come to life and will bear fruit in us in the name of Jesus. We pray and we receive every single of the nine traits, the nine attributes of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that may be evident in our lives and that we will nourish it with your word and we will obey you at all times in the name of Jesus. I pray that none of us will ever fall back to perdition and start displaying the works of the flesh, which will ultimately lead to death. Thank you once again, Holy Spirit. Thank you for helping us. Blessed be your name, O Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Shalom.